Welcome to Syntax. This is the React Server Components show. React Server Components have been sort of cooking for, I don't know, what was it, December 2020 hmm. when they were first announced? Um, and here we are, January 2024. So however many years that is, uh, I feel like we are finally at a spot where we know what they are. We can. There's people using them in production, and we're at a spot now where React devs are going to say, okay, what are these? How do I use them? What are the benefits? What are the gotchas, the design patterns? Because it's it's a fairly substantial upgrade to React. Um, and we're going we're gonna to talk all about the, the pieces and how it works together. But let's talk about Sentry. You have a React application and you are goofing some code up like I tend to do in your React application. You're going to need some error exception, performance tracking, uh, session replay telling you and helping you figure out what went wrong, where, how, all that good stuff. So Sentry is fantastic for that. Check it out, sentry.io. Use coupon code TASTYTREAT for two months for free. Sick. How you doing today, Scott? Oh, hey, man. Doing... I'm doing just about as good as one person can do. Uh, <laughs> to, to give some context, we're recording this on January 9th. Uh, yesterday was Monday, January 8th, a.k.a. Uh, Michigan won the national championship in football, which uh, means nothing to Wes as being, one, not from the United States, and two, not caring about sports, especially American football. <laughs> but for me, I, uh, you know, many people like – you know, they, they make University of Michigan football their entire personality. That was not me. I went to school at, at that school and never went to a single football game. So it wasn't until after I graduated that I got really into Michigan football. And you know what, man? They've been absolute uh, dog SHIT since I went to school there. And in fact, <laughs> like my freshman year was maybe the last year they were decent. And um, I've been waiting this long for them to be good again. And they had an undefeated season they did not lose a wow. single game and Seriously? then they won the national championship uh they they beat all the the you know they beat alabama they beat um ohio state all of our big rivals and stuff in college football man there's a lot of teams and uh yeah it was absolutely wild and uh my my wife and i were just screaming our brains out last night so uh i'm doing great today i'm having a lot of fun congratulations that's that's good and I like Michigan. Big fan. I've been there many, many times, and uh, I'm happy to hear that the football team did did well. I, I'm I'm still blown away that the American the like, college football is so <laughs> wild like that. Like like I went to university, and like we had a hockey team, and I went to one of their their things, and there was like 11 people there. Oh, really? You know, like like you you grew up like watching like this is what university and, and college is like, and you have these campuses mm. and you walk around and there's these huge football games and like, it's nothing, nothing like that in Canada. Uh, so I would like to go to it. Even like high school football down in the South is, is pretty big too, isn't it? Yeah, it's, it's, it's very popular, but Michigan uh, specifically the the big house where the Michigan football team plays is like the largest stadium in the country. I mean, it's okay. that big. It's massive. So like going to a football game there, which I have been to, by the way, I didn't go to any when I was at school. They're, they're just, it's insane. It's it's very loud. It's very intense. And like people go nuts for it. So I would yeah, like to do the Buffalo Bills tailgating experience at some mm -hmm. point in my life. That seems super fun. Yeah. My uh, my realtor is, has uh, like at the Broncos stadium, he has like 10th road tickets. You're like basically with the players. And so he takes his clients to games. So I got to go to a game and we did oh, this whole pregame VIP thing because he's, <laughs> you know, fancy. And we're bad. We're we're getting all free food and hanging out with past players and stuff like that. It was a pretty cool. Love it. All right. Let's talk about React server components um, and what they are, how they work, all of that good stuff. So first of all, React server components are a totally new par paradigm. Um, in React, meaning that React, of course, you were able to render React on the server in the past, but that you generally had it to list, sort of like lean on a framework for that kind of thing. The React is sort of becoming a little bit more opinionated, whereas 
you used to have to like lean on like a remix or a Next.js for these types of things. You probably still will for a, a framework, but a lot of the how things are server rendered, how they fetch data, mm. how they are loaded, how they are sent from the server to the browser, those things are being done opinionatedly. <laughs> and <laughs> that is really cool because it means that we're going to be able to have React components that work across any React application. Yeah, I think the coolest thing is that it, it's going to establish patterns for things that uh, a lot of people are needing to do right now. But yep. it, it adds that, I think the, the big thing for, for folks who are scared of it, it adds that additional layer of complexity. You're not running this on the client exclusively anymore. And once you add that server layer into the picture, I think it could get people scared. But you know, for me, I haven't built a web app without a server <laughs> connected essentially in a, in a while. So for me, like I may be a little less intimidated by the fact that, hey, there's this this server now that has to be a part of your workflow beyond just hitting an API, right? Yeah. I So a lot of people are, there's a lot of opinions flying and we'll get into to some of those in a bit. But honestly, so I took my entire website, which is a, a Gatsby React-based website, hmm. and I converted... Um, the layout, the header, the footer, and a couple pages. So not the whole thing. It's a it's a pretty big website with many thousands of pages. But um, just to sort of like get a feel for it. And then I also built a couple little smaller applications just um, by themselves so I could test out a few things. And I was surprised at how much, like two things. A, yes, you have, there's a lot more thinking that goes into it, a lot more paradigms and that. It's certainly a lot more tricky. Uh, but B, the amount of code that I had to delete, a lot, like lots of custom hooks, mm. um, lots of like API endpoints, um, serverless functions. They certain I just deleted a lot of them because I was able to just bring that logic into a server component. So, what is a server component? A server component is a component, a React component that is here we go rendered <laughs> on the server, wow. meaning that it is not rendered on the client. Um, all of the data fetching, that's probably the biggest one. All of the looping, templating, everything that needs to happen happens on the server and React simply sends, I'll explain what it is in just a second, but essentially React sends HTML from the, the server to the client and it's just rendered out on the thing. So why why would you ever want to do that? First of all, server components are asynchronous, meaning we've never had asynchronous components in React before. And what that means is you're able to simply await a fetch before you return your JSX. And it's it's beautiful because you simply say, like, let's say we wanted to list the syntax podcasts. Uh, const shows equals await fetch the syntax API. And then ben immediately beneath that, we loop over each of the shows and render out the title and the description and all that stuff that's associated with it. And that is amazing because it takes care of, like, you don't need a hook that is initially undefined. And then when the data fetches, it updates and it re-renders a component. You don't need that anymore, right? There's no custom hook in there. There's no loading state because mm. you're simply just waiting for the thing to be fetched before you go ahead. So you can take out a lot of your loading states. Um there's no API endpoints needed in a lot of cases because it's rendered on the server. You can literally, and this is the same thing with a lot of these meta frameworks, you can just query your database directly in a function. So you don't need to make a REST API. You don't need a GraphQL API. You can straight up SQL statement, Drizzle, Prisma, SQLite, whatever you're, you're fetching your data or whatever you're doing server side to get your data that needs to happen server side. It it's simply just is done, and you don't, you can import all your server side packages right into you, your React component, which is really really nice. And that's the one thing when we built our Svelte site where I was just like, oh, this is really nice, you know? Yeah, you know what? It's so funny to me because like I came from Meteor World, as I've mentioned a hundred times on this show, and yeah. like that's how you did stuff in Meteor. <laughs> so there were there were I I didn't encounter a loading state until I started moving my code base off of Meteor. And that was always like weird for me. It's like, I have to now worry about 
a, a status of this application where there's no data here. Yeah. Like if I'm using the data, why do I got to worry about waiting for that data? So for me, that was always like, that was like a, a major sticking point. So it's interesting to hear now that the sticking point for people is moving from that, you know, I had to worry about loading states or in a status where there was no data to now worrying about a situation where you're getting the data directly from the database. And also, you know, you know, people dunking on like the database queries directly in your components. That, that's wild to me. That's what I've always wanted. I want that. I want that yeah. connection, right? Because like, I, hey, your your component needs the data. Like it feels like that's the perfect place to load the data to me. And I think a lot of that initial ugh, to somebody yeah. seeing a button with an inline SQL query on uh, inside of it, people didn't people didn't realize that there is a difference between server components and client components. They are always, mm. always, always, always mm -hmm. separate files. Um, you can you can put your your database logic in a separate file uh, and import that function into it, and you can mark it as We'll talk about it. It's a use server. Mark it as a server function. It will only ever run it on the server. So mm -hmm. you don't have to worry about, like, it, it's not running on the client, obviously, right? Um, but I think, I think a lot of people had a quick knee-jerk reaction to that type of stuff. Um, yeah. Why, why yeah. would you want to run something client, or sorry, server-side? Um, large dependencies do not need to be loaded on the client. If you need a big package to... Uh, to do something on the client. You don't need to load in a meg of JavaScript. You can just use that server side where it's already loaded and simply just send the eight divs as a result to the actual server. So it's going to be much smaller. You don't have to find a client-friendly version of something and make sure it works in all the browsers. As long as the markup can be sent to the server, then you're in good shape. And same thing with like file system API. So I did a bunch of examples where... I was literally reading how many files I had in the file system mm. and then putting that into a button um, in a client component. We'll talk about that in just a second. It's, it's pretty cool to be able to just say, all right, this one is only server side and I can use all of the server side APIs that I could ever imagine or ever want. Yeah, it feels really positive to me. I don't. I don't know how yeah. else to say that. Yeah. Well, we haven't got to the rest yet, so hold. On. You might. You might. <laughs> you might. You might change your mind. I'm. I'm. I, I was. I'll say. I, I know. I told myself I would hold back on opinions, but um, <laughs> uh, there's a lot of like initial. Ah, really? That's the best mm. way. And mm. um, I think that will change, but I'm not sure. And uh, there's. There's a lot, just asking on Twitter, there's a lot of people who are like, uh-uh. But I think it's going to be okay. We'll talk about those in a second. So let's talk <laughs> about server components. We just talked about server versus client components. So client components are components that have state, components that have custom use effects, um, components that have event handlers on click, on submit, all of that good stuff. Um, and the weird thing about this is that Client components are still server rendered initially. However, they are rehydrated on the client, much like you would expect on a traditional, like rehydrated uh, server side rendered and then rehydrated on the, the browser approach. Like that's what we've been doing a long time. The, the big difference here is that not everything is a client component like it previously was. And in fact, you have to sort of opt in to client components in React when you do need to do the things that we just mentioned. When you do need custom state effects event and event handlers and anything else that like you're accessing the window object or something like that, that's when you would reach for a client component. And initially, I was like, you can't put state in a server component? Yeah. Like, doesn't that, initially, that sounds yeah. awful. But mm. you, know, you know what's just as good as state on the server? Variables. Data? Oh. Yeah, data. Oh. Yeah. <laughs> You're right. Yeah. Variables yeah. as state. Yeah. You don't need custom state on the server side because totally. you simply just await it. It's a synchronous. So you simply just await the fetch request and then you you have the thing. And that, that state never updates because it's server rendered. You can re-render the server components. I'll talk about that in a sec as well. But again, if you need to re-render it, then you simply just rerun that fetch request. 
and then it will return the whole component. And you know who's going to be particularly adept at picking up those concepts? Anybody who's used Astro or anybody who's done like just straight up JavaScript on the client. Hey, <laughs> you yeah. know, if you're if you're writing, you don't write your interactive um, JavaScript to interact with things and make them interactive on the server. That makes no sense, right? Uh, yeah. Why, why would the server care about, you know, events for a slideshow? They d- it doesn't care at all, right? As, that's exactly my next point is I'll say the first point here is that components are server rendered by default. So when you are building a React application, by default, everything is server rendered. Um, and then you opt in to client side components when you need interactivity and uh, updating state. So if, if you think about the way that we used to do it, a PHP backend and you add a little bit of jQuery on top to make that part interactive. Um, React Islands is another example that is, is very popular where you have an existing monolith application and then part of your application is built in React because that is the piece that needs to be interactive, right? Or JS Sprinkles, um, lots of different mm. frameworks out there where you server render the whole thing and then you use a JS Sprinkles library to make the parts that you need interactive. And if you think about React client components in the same way, you say, okay, I understand. This whole website is server rendered, but now I want to make these parts interactive, have click handlers, have custom state, drag and drop. Then you opt in to being a client component. And and just for the audience, um, when Wes says things like JS Sprinkles, he's not referring to a library called JS Sprinkles. He's referring to sprinkling in actual JavaScript as needed, not like uh, not like some kind of actual technique or whatever. He he's just he just likes sprinkles. Yeah, uh, Alpine JS is probably the big one uh, in yeah. the space. There, you go back and listen to episode five sixty eight with Caleb Porzio. He's the author behind Alpine JS, and he explains um, that whole idea of JavaScript sprinkles, which is. If you've been around since jQuery days, it's really not all that complicated. Um, it's just a bit more declarative when you use Alpine JS, kind of like Angular One. If you rem- anyone remembers that as well, yeah. If anybody remembers Angular One, for sure. How server components work: the server will render the component and send the React code over the wire, um, and you can essentially think of that as the React server will render. It's not HTML, but if you think about it as HTML, like, for example, if you had a list of podcasts from Syntax and you wanted to server render it because you wanted to format them in a certain way and it's much faster to do it on the server, um, you can think of React as just sending the div HTML mm. and then the React on the client side will say, oh, I got some, I got some HTML from the server. <laughs> Let me just put that into that part of the website where it belongs. And what it's actually sending is a React component with references and all of the data in it. There's a really nice Chrome extension that you can see the pieces being streamed in from the Mm. server to the client. And when I saw that, I was like, okay, this makes a lot of sense of how it's working. But if you kind of imagine it as just hunks of HTML are being, and that's how HTMX works. You're just sending hunks of HTML to update part of the website. Yeah. And I love that. You know, it, it's one of those things that I think makes so much sense <laughs> if, you, if you think about it in terms of how we work on the web. I don't know why it works any differently. All right. So now comes the tricky bits. And cool. this is the, the where the tears sort of come when people are trying to move an existing application. Because if you have a medium to large size React application, I would even say small, small medium to large, uh, and you want to move it to server components, you're in for for a couple hard days. Uh, okay. Because how many hard days would you say? Um, depends on the size, obviously. Like to give it, to give you an idea, uh, being after building two small applications, I took my website, which is not just a list of links that gets a hundred on Lighthouse score. There's many thousands of pages. There's guides on there. There's there's tips, there's blog posts, there's a mm. whole store built into it. There's quite a bit of stuff on that, that website. So I built the the nav, the footer, the layout 
Um, I poured it over the style components because that's what my styles were, were built in. And that probably took me three and a half hours. And I bet if I were to port over the rest of the website, I would probably need another like 15, 20 hours, which is, okay. is fairly significant for, it's not a large application. If you have yep. an application with lots more interactivity, my site is primarily content based. Um, if you got a lot more interactivity, then you're, you're going to be doing a whole lot more. And the reason behind that is because, like I said, server components by default and the rules of putting server components inside of client components and vice versa are a little bit tricky. So server components, like think of, generally you can think of your page as a server component. And then as you get into smaller pieces of your website, those are all server components until you get to one where you say, oh, that needs interactivity. Hmm. This has buttons. This has um, drag and drop. This has a map in it. So server components can have client components. Um, however, client components cannot have server components. And yep. that's where the red React errors start being thrown because you start, you say, oh yeah, let me just, let me just take that server component of the latest episodes. And let me let me throw it into this thing that is a client component. And then it says, you can't do that um, because client components and server components are separate things. I have a good metaphor however, for this, Wes. Yeah. Or do you want to do your however first? No, go for it. Please, please go. Yeah. If you think about it, like you, if you think about it like a tree, which is often how we think about React applications in general, right? You have leafs and all those things, right? Um, you could think of client components as like the foliage of a tree and any of the server components as like wood or, or branches and trunks, right? You can't go from leaf to trunk, but you can go from trunk to or branch to leaf, right? You can't go from leaf to branch, branch to leaf. Yeah. And your, your server components are kind of inherently, uh, I don't want to say thicker, harder. <laughs> they're, they're, they're more, there's more infrastructure there. I guess you could say they're thicker components. We got uh, server components are thick components. Um, <laughs> but uh, yeah, you can't go from leaf to branch, I guess, is ultimately what I'm trying to say. And that makes perfect yeah. sense to me. It, it makes sense. But in practice, you run into this issue a lot in, in my mm, experience. Really? Um, and so there is a way to make it work. And I'll explain that in just a second. But like, let's imagine uh, you have a cart. Um, and you can drag items into your cart, right? So you've got a bunch of products and a cart. You drag uh, something from the uh, products into your cart. So your cart obviously has to be a client component because it needs to handle drag and drop and clicks and, and deletes and all of that stuff, right? However, if you want to calculate the total of the user's cart, Mm -hmm. That's probably better as a server component because there's a lot of logic really? that goes into yeah. how much shipping costs, any coupons that they may have. Um, if you could always just generate that that, that total value on the server though as data, yeah, you know. Yes, well, that's that's the fix. But the, what what somebody will do is they'll say, okay, well, I'll make a server component called total value. That's a server component, and I'll just try drop that inside of my cart component which is client, and then it mm. eh, can't do it. Mm -hmm. um, so the fix to it is that, and I think that this is just like a, a DX issue with JSX in general, is that client components can have server components passed in as children or as props. Mm. So you can't put a server component in a client component file, but you can wrap, Jeez. You, can, you can be in oh. a server component you can have a client component and then wrap that client component around another server component or pass it in via props. And you're probably, I'm probably losing you right now. Go to the show notes and click the tweet that I have. I've, I made a whole visualization for how it actually works. Um, and that's sort of the way to go at, around it. But you can't, like if you're used to just going into a file called cart.js and putting in a component, you have to now pass that in via props in order to, to make it work. It's kind of frustrating to do that. And I think it's more of a having to understand and getting new design patterns in place to make it work. But 
I think a lot of devs are not used to this type of work. Hmm. Yeah, that's wild. I, I yeah, I'm surprised. Did you discover that yourself, or did you see somebody talk? Because that's a, a an interesting. Like, I don't know if I would have like instantly said, "Hey, can I pass this as a prop here?" Yeah, because like, like literally any other framework I've ever worked in, in all of my web development career, if you have a partial or a component or mm -hmm. a svelte or whatever, you can just import the sucker and put it in, mm -hmm. and and you're off and running. But now you really have to think about this. And it's, it's, it is, I think it is a bit of a foot gun because you think, oh yeah. And the other thing is that the way to fix a lot of these red errors is you just mark something as a client component. So you, to mark mm -hmm. something as a client component, you write use client at the top of the file. And that makes that file a client. You cannot put a client component and a server component in the same file which is another frustrating thing that you have to have multiple files yeah. if you're trying to do like for an, an example would be with that cart. Um, if you wanted to put that button in there, you would have to have two or three files mm -hmm. just to render out the cart. And that doesn't burn me that much. I complain about this enough with Svelte. I'm like, just yeah. let me put them in the same component. Well, Wes, you'll be happy to know that Svelte 5 fixes that. I've been using Svelte 5 has a new oh, way good. to do. You can do uh, multiple components per file now. And so I have yep. been doing that a lot and it is nice. But you know, that use client thing is interesting to me because, you know, one of the big arguments about React is that it is just JavaScript. Is use client like any sort of JavaScript standard or is that, are, are we like now past the point where React is just JavaScript? React is-, is That's a good is, question because, because like it's it's a JSX thing. It's not a JSX thing. No, it's not. It's a um, React thing. It's, yeah. it's a React thing. And it's a way to uh, provide metadata to the file. And yeah. I, I think that's a, okay. The use client is not a, a standard. We have use strict. That yeah. is well, that's, strict that's mode, what I'm saying. Right? It's fine, you know. But, you know, like com people like Astro have been doing this with their like markdown at the top of single file components or remix, whoever. Um, yeah. It's not just JavaScript. That that argument always kind of bugged me, anyways. But let's talk about forms because likely a lot of the use case where you have to do the aforementioned dancing between server and client components is with forms because forms need inputs from your user. You often want to do client sidey things with your mm. forms, like validation when somebody types in something, you want to reformat it, credit card input, etc. And then you always need that all of the data from that form on the client side. And it's long been a pain in the butt of dealing with forms in React. You've always had to reach for some sort of third-party library or roll your own custom state hook and never been a big fan of that. So part of server components, they have rolled out um, this thing called uh, server actions and form, form actions and server actions. So... Form actions are so like React is now becoming opinionated about the way that you work with and submit forms uh, to the server, which is thank goodness. Like, I'm so happy about this because we can now, you don't have to fuss with it uh, anymore. And it is using the standard form data API, which is a JavaScript standard for describing and parsing form data into a JavaScript object and being able to send that to the server. So hmm. form actions are functions that run when your form is submitted and you pass a function to the action prop on a form. So in HTML, you have an action that is a string and that string is a URL of where the form is submitted to. Um, in React, the, form, the action property is referenced to a function that will run when somebody hmm. submits that form so and then the, the, that function itself will give you the entire form data object so you simply just write a regular javascript function handle form submit the first argument of that function is the form data and then when that uh when that form is submitted you have access to the entire form data api and that can happen on the client side that happens on the client side by default and uh Svelte users will recognize this. This is kind of how forms work in Svelte uh, Kit. Um, you get access to the form data as a prop, or uh, 
I got to say, as somebody who's been doing a, a similar workflow, I love this. Um, yes. This is how I prefer to work. So um, props on React for doing this. And honestly, you know, React has long been not opinionated on these types of things. And it's the reason why we have things like Remix and Astro. And I'm happy to see that React is making um, choices there. Exactly. Uh now, those form actions run on the client by default, I said. However, if you mark them with a use server in the mm. function, now that function will only be run on the server. So again, this is another little bit of a confusing thing. It's one of those things, it makes sense if you think about it, and there probably was lots of discussion about it, but the initial reaction to this is, so you're telling me components are server by default, and client you have to opt into client side with use client. However, form actions are client by default, and you have to opt in to server when you want them to run on the server. And that might make no sense, but if you think about it, forms are going to be client side if you want to, to do any of your interaction. So mm. marking it with a use server, um, make sure that that function will only ever run on server. Does it do a full page reload, or is it to do it progressive enhancement like? So... That's what happens is if you mark it with a use server, it will then submit the form data to the server. It doesn't do a page reload or anything. It simply just submits the data to the server. Um, and then you can then return data from the server or you mm -hmm. can return an entire component um, that needs to be re-rendered on the page. And it's actually really, really simple. I, I like this a lot where you can simply take a client side variable Call the the function from the client, and that variable will be available to you on the server side, which is just like mm. not mind blowing because we certainly have had things like that. But uh, be that like s seamless transition of passing a variable from the client side to the server side without having to do any API, no REST API, no JSON stringify, none of that mm -hmm. is just man, I'm. I'm in love. I absolutely love it. Yeah, love that. Buttons can have actions as well. So this is one thing I, I thought was kind of weird and svelte is we have like a button that says like fetch transcript. Um, and I always had to wrap it in an entire form tag to make it work. Um, mm. as, and I and so much that I made a, a component that was simply just a button <laughs> component. You that, don't like that. that? See, I like that about svelte because then, I mean, that's how it would work without JavaScript. You know what I mean? Yeah. Yeah, that's true. Like you, you, you maybe do want that. But like, for example, like if you want a button that when you click it, it runs off and fetches some stuff, it's never going to be run server side. It's just a delete button, delete something. Yeah. Um, it would be nice to do that. So you can, you can put them on a button. You can put them on, um, there's a couple other ones. I think it's option as well. I, I know to, to be clear here about this, file, you can actually hit, the the server actions with just straight up javascript and svelte you don't have to wrap it in a form but i recently did this and i opted to i had like 40 buttons on the page and i opted to, to wrap every single one wrap of those them. in a form yeah but it's true i do like it because it's you're not writing any other functions it's just declarative form right yeah and yeah, you give yeah. it an action it's true every single if you go in the admin back end of the syntax dashboard there's probably 1400 buttons on that page you know more than that actually there's <laughs> There's probably 5,000 buttons on that page, and they're all four tags. <laughs> There's probably 5,000 buttons on that page. <laughs> so along with these form, uh, form action server actions, we now have a couple new hooks uh, that will allow us to work with these forms. So we've used form status, status, status. What am I saying? That gives you a reactive variable if, if the form is currently being submitted, so you can do your loading indicator. Something's, something's being submitted to the server side. You're waiting for it to come back. Um, use form state is used for displaying error or success messages from the back end. So if your form needs to return some additional data that mm -hmm. needs to be displayed in the form, you can use use form state. And then there's a use optimistic hook that will allow you to do oh, cool. optimistic updating. So for example, an optimistic update would be if you have a to-do list and you add an item and you hit enter, you you kind of want that item to be immediately appended to the list of to-do lists. You don't want to be sitting around waiting for it to go to the server, save it to the database, 
come back, say it's successful, and then send it back to the to the client. Because in almost every use case, that's exactly what's going to happen successfully. Mm -hmm. So optimistic updates will say, yeah, this is probably what's going to happen. And if it doesn't, you can roll it back. There's That's what the optimistic um, hook will allow you to do. And you can display an error and say, ah, actually, that didn't, that didn't work after one second of us trying. Um, and most, most data handling libraries will have some sort of optimistic UI built in. So again, it's nice that it's all built into JavaScript. Yeah. I optimistic UI is one of those easy wins for folks. If you want what's perceived performance, uh, you know, oftentimes your, your server can be the slower part of it waiting for the database to respond or just those messages to go back and forth. But if you add in optimistic UI, it feels very fast and it can be with these types of tools, it looks like a little bit easier. Optimistic UI has never been something that has been super easy. So I'm, I'm really excited to see that they thought about that. Another example of optimistic UI is on Facebook. If you leave a comment on Facebook and you put a link in the URL and you hit enter, immediately it'll just be a plain text string. And mm -hmm. what's happening is that Facebook is saving that comment to the database, but it's also checking if there are any URLs and if those URLs have OG images and if that URL has been banned or any of that stuff. Right? Doing it in the background, yeah. Exactly. So it's doing all of that in the background. So immediately you see, oh, my comment worked. Um, I don't need to hit the submit button again. But after uh, two seconds or so, then you see, oh, my comment has been updated with the actual hyperlinked link and the open graph image has been embedded into it. Suspense. So we've had React Suspense <laughs> for a while, um, and this is going to make it really, really easy. So you can take a React Suspense, which is a component, and you wrap it. You wrap components that need, may take a while to to render. So mm -hmm. in an example that I did, I put a I intentionally made a component that takes four seconds to render, and if you have a single component on your page that takes four seconds to render, guess what is also taking four seconds to show up? The entire page, right? So mm. one little component could make your whole page extremely slow. It's kind of promise.all the entire thing. So what React Suspense will do is you can wrap your possibly slow components or you can wrap anything that fetches data in a suspense component. And what, the, what will happen is the server will immediately send a loader component. You specify what shows up when you are loading um, and you're sort of in a suspended state. And you can show a spinner. You can show nothing and wait for two seconds and then show a spinner. You can show skeleton screen. That's pretty common in applications where it's just gray boxes where the content should show up. You can show an actual skeleton. You can show an actual skeleton, mm -hmm. uh, whatever you want. And, and then the server will just continue working on rendering that component. So it, not to hold up the rest of the actual website. And then the server will stream them from the mm -hmm. server into the client when it actually is rendered. And um, you got to be careful because you, you can get a lot of spinners on your page. And we've all been on those apps before <laughs> where there's, eight spinners for three seconds and then the website slowly comes in. But you can also wrap multiple suspense components in a single suspense component, uh, which is kind of cool. So if you had three or four things that were loading and you wanted to say, all right, I only want to fade it in once everything has been done, then you can, you can wrap there. And it just, it works. It's just wrap it in a suspense component. You give it a loader prop, you're done. There's no, there's no creating custom fetch requests like it used to be um, because it, it just knows that your server side component is asynchronous and it knows how to handle it. That's Ooh. nice. Yes. Suspense, man. Hey, no, you can't make any more jokes about waiting for suspense anymore. That's played in 2024. <laughs> All right. Um, I told myself I would not sprinkle in opinions too much, um, but now's the opinion hour. So Scott and I are going to, going to let them fly. Um, opinions. What I like it is, extremely easy to run things on the server and that client server passing is is effortless um, mm. and i'm a huge fan of that in all of these meta frameworks being able to just 
spin up a project and have a client server model rendering out reactivity in like, I could probably do it in seven and a half minutes, maybe even less, you know? And like, that's, that's ideal to me. Um, first class support for forms. Big fan of that. I already said that. Um, what I don't like, unless Scott, do you have any, any things that you, you mm -hmm. do or do not, do not like? I know you haven't um, used it. I'm going to say here from my perspective, yeah, I have not used this, but I don't really dislike anything that we've mentioned so far. I am like, I'm optimistic about all this stuff and I'm having a hard time feeling down on too much of it because I typically work in sites that have a tightly integrated backend. So for me, that's nothing new. I typically like to have my data where I use it. That's nothing new for me. I personally like the form action stuff because that's how I'm used to writing apps. So all of this kind of, to me, brings React into a place where I would actually want to use it as React. Now, for me, the negatives come in when I think, how do I do this? Do yeah. I just use Next.js? Is that it? Do I have to Do I have to use Next? I don't... I'm going to be real. I don't love Next.js, even with all this stuff. It's not my favorite platform. So if the answer is you got to use Next.js to use all this stuff, I'm out. I'm sorry. Um, <laughs> Good. But uh, yeah, what what is that how piece? It just feels like a big mystery to me. Next.js was the first framework to this. Um, I'm not sure how much we can say about it, but like Remix will support this kind of stuff. And there was a thread from Ryan, Ryan Florence the other day where he was talking about all of these features that Remix had mm -hmm. and component data loading. Um, there was a whole bunch of them. I'll link it up in the show notes. But basically said like, these we don't need these things in, in Remix anymore because now React has them. And isn't that kind of nice? So I imagine Remix is going to get it. Uh, there's support already in Tanstack, which is kind of wild to think that all the Tanstack stuff is kind of, it's a framework in itself, you know? Yeah, totally. But let's talk about like like what what what's all the pushback for this type of stuff? Like the the big things that I heard from people is a this is a massive rewrite. Yes, I do not have time to fuss around with another rearchitecting of my application. You know, like I already did function components to class components, and then I did class components to <laughs> back to or like it was create class, then it was class components, then it was uh, hooks. Uh, and now we're we're talking about this whole client server methodology, and it's it's a lot, especially with a pretty big one. So it's a big rewrite. Um, a lot of people said, "I don't see the benefit. Our app is fast. We don't need this. Mm -hmm. I'm fine with having everything rendered on the client." We heard a lot of what happens when there's front end and back end teams. You know, like mm -hmm. you're kind of blurring the lines here, and it's just too complex. A lot of people are like, I just moved to Svelte. I moved to Astro. I moved to something else because this seems like a lot of complexity for the fact that how simple it is in a lot of the, the other things. And, and still also like React still does not have a, like a nice state management. Like we obviously have <laughs> yeah, state, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> but you got to prop drill it all yeah. the way down. And then yeah, which which like, state management library do you want to use in React? That's the other thing. A lot of the state management libraries are broken on this yeah. as well because you kind of have two two different um, applications, right? So I think we got to sort of sit and wait to see what the state management solution. Right now, the solution is that you can pass data via props between server and client components and vice versa. Hmm. What other downsides are here? You really need to rethink your architecture. So I found myself having to split components up into different files quite a bit. Which you don't like. We've, we've no, established that you don't like, like that. Or yeah. even like as simple as a button. Mm -hmm. Sometimes you have to put a button, a form submit button in another file. Um, mm. And I was yeah, not weird. Yeah. a major fan of that. Or sometimes I was like, oh, like my navigation is has like a, a resize observer in it, you know? Mm, so all, yeah. all of a sudden my entire oh, navigation so is no longer us, yeah. a client side, a server component. Now it's a client component. It would be nice if you could hit, wrap that in a some sort of wrapper to say, hey, this bit, this little tiny bit of JavaScript, this resize observer, just execute this only on the client. Yes. 
And that's what a client component is. Right. But then the other thing is like the, you can't get the current page server side in Next.js. I was like, I was like trying to redo my navigation and I was just like going through all these threads and um, some, there was like one of those like threads that have gone off the rails because <laughs> every, some guys like, for sales, a ninety trillion dollar company, and can't figure out how to get the server your the like the current page URL to highlight mm. the current page in your navigation is next to impossible on the server unless God. you opt into using cookies, which then opts you mm. out of all of the Vercel caching and like in Svelte, you just import the freaking page and you get yeah. it. You don't yeah. have to, page, you, you get to access the entire it. URL property, whatever yeah, you want. You just the path it, name, you know? any of that stuff. Yeah. I don't I don't like those butts, you know? I don't like yeah. butts. And Can we clip that? <laughs> Randy. I don't like those clip. butts. <laughs> I don't like butts of like Yeah. Yeah, I could do that, but then I have to convert the whole thing to a server component, but then or a client component, and then this piece needs to be a server component. So Push those feelings back because I think that we just need more design principles. And I will probably have a follow-up show in three months or so to figure out a little bit more of these architecture examples. Um, oh, another downside, third-party third components. So you're importing a component from some library. Uh, let's, let's say React Aria. Maybe React Aria is, is already set up for this, but some component that's been made before six months ago. Mm. It's very likely that that component does not have a use client at the top of it. Oh, right. So how, wow. so, it's, yeah. so it's a server component by default, but it has a, a click handler in it. What do it you get? That should have been the other way around. Uh, yeah. yeah. I, think they, I think they did it by default because you should, you should default to server, right? Everything should be server rendered by default. You shouldn't have to opt in to server. Hmm. So now you have to wrap, you have to make another file that simply just imports that component, Oof. takes all the props, or no, maybe you can just export from, use like the ES6 export whatever from, but then you just mm -hmm. pop a use, use client at the top of it. So annoying. Yeah, that's rough. Yeah. Um, <laughs> design patterns, let's talk about it real quickly. Everything should be server by default. Your high level components should be server components, and then you opt in to client components as, as you need it. Try to go as small as possible, so like a notifications bubble, rather than your entire header being a cl client component, maybe just the notifications bubble would be a client component. Parting links here, there's a really good Chrome extension I'll link up. There is a, another framework, you'll be glad to hear, a new hmm. React framework called Waku, <laughs> and Waku is a framework like Next.js or Gatsby or Remix that is implemented using React server components from the default. And it's from the same dev as Zustand. Yeah. Um, I was I was low on Waku until I found out who made it. And then I'm high on Waku. Yeah. And Vercel is funding it as well. So you've you've got to think that between Vercel, React, and the guy who made Zustand like one of the best state management libraries out there. It's great. You got to think yeah. that they think, you know what? This state management thing is not solved yet. Yeah. And uh, we got to explore this a little further. Uh, Mux.com is built in server components. So if you're using the Chrome extension I talked about, go to Mux.com mm. and start hovering over URLs. You'll see them being preloaded as, as you hover over top of them. And you'll see the parts come in as you change pieces on the website. And that is it. Hopefully you enjoyed uh, that. We'll get into sick pics and shameless plugs, but that is React Server Components. That was a big show. I researched the crap out of that for the last couple of months. So I'm glad I to appreciate that, get Wes. this one I, out there. Yeah. Yeah, I'm feeling very knowledgeable about Server Components now. And I, uh, yeah, I, I really... Uh... I, I really think the audience is going to get a lot of out of that because as somebody who's only seen the high level about these things, I think that gave me a lot deeper insight into what it actually would look like to use this stuff in the real world. So uh, thank you for, for doing all that research. Okay. Uh, now is the part of the show where we get into sick picks and shameless plugs, things we want to pick or plug. I'm going to be picking, I'm going to go back in time here. I'm picking a CD drive or a DVD drive. <laughs> what? Um, 
yes. I have been – I had a big old stack of DVDs and CDs from like old projects and stuff, and I've been ripping all this data, whether it's been projects that I've had from a long time ago. I'm trying to get all that physical media out of here. I'm backing up stuff. You know, I, I just – I'm tired of having that stuff around the house. So I found this Asus Zen Drive with a built-in USB-C cable. You don't got to power. You just plug it right in USB-C. It's a tiny little itty-bitty CD drive, and it's $28. So if you are ripping, if you got a stack of CDs somewhere that you've just been putting off, man, this little $28 drive, I just popped it in there, it functioned that's great. That's so cheap. Yeah, it's amazing that it's so cheap. And I went through maybe about, you know, 200 some DVDs that I had of old school projects where there were songs, you know, when I was in I was in school, I was constantly working on on music projects or programs or something like that and you know, people might not know this, but hey, my my like Le C hard drive was only 200 gigabytes and uh even then that thing died. So it was important to keep stuff backed up on on DVDs or whatever. So you you might be like me and have physical media sitting around. And I think this this thing as a little twenty eight dollar CD drive was super fantastic. I'm going to sick pick. Um, I gotta make sure I, I'm not showing my phone number. There we go. Uh, <laughs> Leatherman Arc, which is a multi tool that mm. I EDC everyday carry. So. I have carried a pocket knife for probably about six years. And you may think that's kind of weird, especially for our uh, like UK and um, Irish listeners, which where apparently it's illegal to carry a knife there. But I carry mm. a knife with me all the time, everywhere I go, because it's super handy. I find myself using it from cutting kids' chicken nuggets in half to just prying at something, popping it open, cutting something. I use it probably... Yeah three times a day um and i've always wanted to carry a multi-tool which is it has a knife it has uh oh, pliers yes. in it yeah. it has screwdriver it has bottle opener scissors is probably the most popular one that i use because kids are always asking me to cut the little tags off their clothes or whatever is coming up oh so you end up using those little scissors okay cool. oh i use the scissors probably as much as the knife, surprisingly, because I used to cut with my knife, but the scissors is a lot more controlled, especially like you have something that is like zip tied, um, like you get something like a package and it's zip tied. You can do the, the scissors have really good um, leverage on them. You could just snip the zip tie rather than trying to pop it open. And I am so happy with this thing because I, I never liked multi tools because you always see those guys with them like holster carrying them on the side, you know, and like <laughs> I'm not that guy yet. But yeah, I, I always I pocket carry that guy. it, and it has a pocket clip on it, and it fits. It's not much bigger than my knife. It goes really small. It has like a couple screwdriver bits in it, a little micro screwdriver. There's cutters in it if you need to cut a piece of wire. And I'm not lying when I say I probably use this five, six times a day just for little stuff. I don't have to go get a tool when I'm doing something. Or, or like you're always the hero when you... Like I was <laughs> you pull a, out your uh, little scissors, you're the hero. Yeah, we were, I was at like a kid's function the other day and like somebody had like bumped so, uh, a picture that was hanging in the hallway and it broke and they're trying to figure out, oh shoot, like I got to fix this thing. And I just uh, like, excuse me. And well, I fixed it with the pliers aside, and then aside. I just like walked off into the sunset like the hero uh, of the day. So I did a crazy amount of, of research on multi-tools and this is the leatherman arc it has the nicest blade it's not cheap but it's one of those things hopefully you don't lose it and you hopefully have it forever and i've been just been my wife got it for me for christmas and i've been so happy with it yeah how what you is that was that one that we'll have to talk about maybe i'm sure christmas gifts will end up becoming sick picks here we haven't talked much about oh holiday. yeah 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 but. no i I, uh, I got a list of stuff i got for christmas that will be upcoming sick picks but this leatherman arc has been High on my list. Awesome. There's magnets in it. That's the other thing. Is it clips? Can we do a whole show on my multi-tool? Because I, I could talk about it forever. It's like when I got my, uh, what's the backpack we have? The Peak, ba yeah. The Peak Design Bag. I got yeah. that thing like six or seven years ago before everybody had it. And I could not stop talking about how awesome it was to people. It is great. <laughs> Although the, uh, the only, my only uh, concern with the Peak Designs backpack is that when I take it through airport security and they stop me because I have uh, audio gear or 
or something in my my bag. Uh, they're yeah. always like, "How the hell do I get this thing open?" Like, oh yeah, <laughs> you pull down on here and you you twist the knob, you bop it, you know, and then it comes open. Yeah. All right. Uh, shameless plugs. Westboss.com forward slash courses for a list of all my courses. Uh, and I'm going to shamelessly plug the Syntax YouTube channel. Hey, we have a YouTube channel, and it used to be Level Up Tutorials, which is one of the reasons why you'll see a lot of my old content there. But for fans of the podcast, we're going to be start pushing episodes out there as full video episodes. So not just the social clips you've been seeing here and there. So if you want to get ahead of it... Um, Sign up for our, our YouTube channel. Go s smash that subscribe button. And you might even see some additional content from me and others here and there as well. I've been doing some kind of one-off videos there uh, for fun. YouTube.com forward slash at Syntax FM. Uh, go ahead and smash that subscribe button. Ring the bell. Do all that stuff. And uh, you'll get Syntax episodes on YouTube. Beautiful. All right. Thanks, everybody, for tuning in. We'll catch you later. Peace. Peace.